This is Voice from the Real World. We welcome you. I'm Rich. I'm Larry. And we have been teaching out of A Course in Miracles. And we have elected today to take a section that probably a lot of people glance over or don't go back to because we're so focused on the text and the workbook and the teacher's manual. But there's a section in the preface which is called What It Says. And it's a section that Helen received from Jesus as some clarification because people were asking for it. And we feel that it is a wonderful section that outlines the basics of the course. And no matter how long you've been in the course, this is still going to have relevance to you. Because, as we know, it's almost like an onion that's peeled. It just keeps getting deeper and deeper in Revelation as we go through these things. So it's called What It Says. It's on page Roman numeral small x 10 in the blue book. What it says. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. To me, this is the foundation for the whole entire course statement right here. I made a little note on that in my notes when we first went over this quite some time ago, you and I in our studies. I put the foundation of the course into eternity where all is one. And then I put not one note was lost in heaven's song. In other words, what doesn't exist doesn't exist. I don't care how hard we try to make a memory real. A memory is not real. And you cannot make it real. When we come to the conclusion of the course, we will come to this realization is that nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. This is it right here. When you get this, you've got it. And what do you got? The peace of God. The peace of God. And the peace of God is the condition of the heavenly mind. So if you want something other than peace, and like in chapter 19 gives us the obstacles to peace, then we have to do some kind of finagling of mind, some distortion of mind to believe that which does not exist is real in some way. And the mind has the ability through faith and belief, all which we've made up, memory is what we've made up, to make something seem real. This is how A Course in Miracles begins. It makes a fundamental distinction between the real and the unreal, between knowledge and perception. Knowledge is truth. Let's just stop there. Knowledge is truth. Knowledge means knowing. It does not mean teaching and learning. Teaching and learning is something we made up, a mind technique that blocks knowledge. See, if I know something but you talk me into learning something, then I have thrown away knowledge. Well, see, too, in our language that we brought into this illusion to establish an illusion, We use terms like knowledge, knowing. This is not what this is talking about here. This is the knowledge of reality. This is the experience of being. Knowing is the experience of your being as the divine son that's one with the Father and co-creator of all creation. It is spirit. Spirit and knowledge are one. When Jesus, when he awoke from the dream, he said, I return, I recognize spirit and spirit's knowledge. Because you can't sep. there's no separation here. Now, what we like to do is we like to make levels of what we call knowledge, our learning, our education, so that we can use for what purpose? To separate us from somebody else based on our intellectual concepts and views. That's not what this is talking about at all. That knowledge is to separate and to divide, just like there is a forgiveness to destroy. It's different from the forgiveness we'll look at in just a little bit. Knowledge is true knowing, which means true communication and communion with all that is, all that is in the Father's mind, which is the Son, which is all of creation. And he contrasts that with perception. So perception is a focus of the mind to do some mind antics wherein it has to look outside itself to prove something real. It sends forth a wish or a message or a messenger and then made the body 
to interpret those, to receive those messages back, and thus we perceive. Right. And we put ourselves with a body in a world where it's a foundational thought system. It's an incorrect or thought system in error. It is the ego thought system. But it's built on learning. You come in as a baby, you learn this thought system, and you learn how to judge and to become expert in this idea of perception, of be able to look, to evaluate, to judge, and make decisions. All of that is found in perception. None of that is found in knowledge. Perception establishes you as the king of your kingdom because as you project, you perceive based on your criteria for your kingdom. And then you set as judge in perception to choose right or wrong, good or bad, pretty or ugly, whatever. And what you do is you reject one side in choosing the other side. So it's a judgment seat. Perception is always a judgment seat. That's why perception has to be corrected. Corrected perception sees only what's true and what's false, not what's right and what's wrong. Right and wrong is the dualistic thought system that we made in this thing called time. In the book of Genesis, it was the wrong tree. It was the tree of the knowledge or, or judgment of right and wrong, of good and evil. It's the wrong tree. Don't eat from that tree because the whole tree is bad. It is an error, and it is not the tree of life. The other thing, too, if you remember from the book of Genesis, is we know that the body is the hero of the dream. We know in order to judge, you have to force difference onto the mind, which there is no difference in the mind. So we utilize the body as a means of differentiation so that we can say it's good, bad, male, female, old, young, attractive, not attractive. And yet, even within that, each person's perception is different. Nine out of ten people will say, well, that person's very attractive. And then one will say, well, no, that person's ugly. But it's interesting in the book of Genesis that it said that after the separation, and then we separate, if you've ever read the Bible, actually Adam's body, according to that story, was Adam, male and female, was in one entity, one body. Then the bodies were separated. Now you had male and female in two separate bodies, differences. And then it says, he knew her. So now knowing someone is based on something outside of yourself. It's tied up in body. It's tied up in sexual relations. It's tied up in creativity within within the bodies, making more bodies. And it's a total distortion of true knowledge, of true communication and communion between the sons of God and the son with the father. See, the rest of the verse you're about to read establishes that. Knowledge is truth under one law, the law of love or God. One law under the law of God. One. Same as. Cause and effect are the same. And that is the law of love or the law of creation, which is a continual sharing of love, of being, of all that is. It is the law of creation. And it is the only law. So in order to finagle a false thought system we have to distort the laws that are already there we can't make up new laws all we can do is distort the one law and make it many laws but that is unreal that is a distortion that is an illusion truth is unalterable eternal and unambiguous it can be unrecognized but it cannot be changed a major condition of knowledge is that there is no change there can be no change There is no time for anything to appear to change. There is no reason for change. Because there is nothing greater than your true reality as the love of God, as the creation of God. If this was necessary to say, it's unalterable, eternal, unambiguous, then in the illusion, we're dealing with the very opposite. We're dealing with that that can be altered. That which is temporal and that which is ambiguous. So... The whole time thing is made up of that. That's why it says when you embrace the holy instant, the Holy Spirit gives you another dream. Because your dream is a dream of fear, and the Holy Spirit gives a dream of peace that begins to bring stability to the mind. It's in a state of stableness, or a type, a level, you might say, of stillness, that the mind begins to be healed. Because that's the only way it can hear the voice clearly. It's no longer projecting its voice of illusion it's hearing the voice of healing we call ourselves at this ministry voice from the real world the real world is still an illusion but it is a reflection of the reality of 
knowledge of heaven, of spirit. And so therefore the real world does not change. It is not ambiguous. The dream does not change. Why? Because the goal of the dream, the goal is always the holy instant, the holy relationship. And that is the firmness, the solidness of this dream. It does not change. Only the characters change. The content does not change. The form may change, but the content of peace and love and spirit does not change. So we know that when we wake up in the happy dream, in the real world, there is really no difference between the real world and the heavenly thought, except that it is understood that it's a dream, it is an illusion, but there's still total peace, total being that's available to that mind. It applies to everything that God created, and only what he created is real. It is beyond learning because it is beyond time and process. It has no opposite, no beginning, and no end. It merely is. Again, we're talking about knowledge. So right away, in this recap that Jesus is bringing to us, he's dealing with this idea of learning, time, and process. Okay, we made that. None of that is real. But everything we made needs to be corrected. It has been corrected. And we need to recognize it. We need to recognize what is real and what is not. What is true, what is false. And we do that by allowing the Holy Spirit to use these things. So he uses time, and he uses learning, and he uses process. That's why there's so much of this is about teaching. That's why this is a course. Because it must be learned. Because we made learning. So if we heal learning, we come to it place of the real world. The world of perception, on the other hand, is the world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. There was a place in the text, and of course everything here is is in the course. This is just a recap. But there's a place where Jesus tells Helen, I have shown you exactly how to determine what is true and what is false. And that was a shocker to me the first time I read it because, well, wait a minute, I don't remember what that is. Well, Here's a really good hint right here. It is a world of time, of change, of beginnings and endings. If it's based on time, if it's based on change, if you can identify a beginning or an ending or a future ending, it is not real. It is not true. I would add difference in there too because (laughs) it's part of that. Sure. It is based on interpretation, not on facts. Now, here's another word, facts. We say, well, and I come from a law enforcement background, so we're trying to establish a fact in a court of law that says this occurred at this time, this is what happened. It is a fact. This is a fact. Well, there are no facts in a dream. Nothing ever happened. This is an illusion. So there are no facts in a dream. The only fact is the creation of God, is the existence and being of the God and his creation and his son. That is the only fact. Everything else must be interpreted. And what is interpretation? Interpretation is looking outside yourself and judging what you're seeing and bringing the message back to yourself. Now, the deception is that that is a process that is governed by that which you are seeing, but it's not. It's governed by your own wish. You sent out the message to see, to prejudge it, prejudice. You set up the situation to be a witness to your own thought system. This is, quote, life. This is, quote, reality on your terms. And your terms have been already set before you see the witnesses to your own thought system. See, projection of this thought of something different, of separation of time, is a setup, the mind set up to deceive itself, to guarantee that it only sees what it sends out. It's a guaranteed self-deception. See, you have to reach a place, and one of the things that happens as you pick up A Course in Miracles is you go through a stage of uneasiness and unsettledness, and you begin to come to this decision about, hey, I don't know about this book. Do I need to put this book down? I don't know about this. Well, that is your mind saying, are you ready to pull back the deception that you put over yourself and see reality. That's all that is. It's the veil thing. Because in the thought of sin and guilt, it says don't dare look under. Don't dare remove the veil. You'll surely die. But in reality, this is the Holy Spirit gently 
calling you to, it's time to pull back the veil and see your reality as the sun. See, remember we read it said truth can be unrecognized. Well, all of this gymnastics of the thought system, of the ego thought system, is for the purpose that we don't recognize. Well, what does recognize mean? Re means again. Cognize, if you know the word cognizant, it says to be aware of. When you recognize something, you are actually remembering your awareness that you had once before. That's why we keep saying this is but an echo, but a memory. But we're going to use memory, the Holy Spirit's going to use memory to restore the thought of your reality, the memory of your reality, the memory of Father to your mind. And that's all that's going on. It is the world of birth and death founded on the belief in scarcity, loss, separation, and death. Before we get into those four things, let's focus on this word belief. In knowledge, there's no such thing as belief. Right. You don't believe in something you know. There's no such thing as faith. So we know that the Course tells us that we use faith, which is a more empowered version of belief, as a tool of mind. And we use seeing, which is the body, to hold on to this thought system. And it's grounded, it's founded in this belief in what? Scarcity, loss, separation, and death. Scarcity means I am not everything and I don't have everything. But the truth is, I am everything and I have everything. Why do I have everything? So I can continue to give everything. Extending the kingdom of God. Loss. We haven't lost anything because it's impossible to lose anything. Separation. We are one. Heaven is oneness. Any other thought is a thought of separation. And of course, the thought of death, which is the opposite, which opposites don't exist in heaven, but opposite to what true life is. True life is the true existence of knowledge and spirit and the mind being a tool of spirit to create, to extend the kingdom of God. It is the opposite of that in any form. Normally when we think of death, we think of a death of a body, but the thought of the body is death. The thought of limitation is death. It uses the, in using the term belief, what we did with belief, the Course says, to you who believe it, it's your reality. So you hear things sometimes said, maybe in a Course gathering or something, that this isn't real, like the body's not real. Well, to the believer in the body that made the body, that's an insane statement. Because to that believer that made that body, and that is preserving that projection through the protected perception of this is real, it's real. It's real. That's why this is a gradual awakening of the mind to realize you're not a figure in this dream. First of all, it's a dream. Secondly, you're not a figure in the dream. You're the actual dreamer of the dream. So it puts you in a different position and you realize that all that's in the dream is what you made it to be through the power of the mind which is capable of making this thing called belief. And once you know that you are the dreamer of the dream, the Holy Spirit now gives you an option. Now you have a decision to make. How do you like your dream so far? I don't like it. Let me give you another dream. Exchange your dream and let me help you dream or let me dream for you another dream. It's called the happy dream. And that is a dream that you can wake up from. You cannot wake up from your nightmare. That's exactly right. I said before, it's such a maze that it's amazing that we made. And without the Holy Spirit's help as a guide, we could never get out of that maze. It is learned rather than given. Again, this thing about learning. That which is given is total. There's a concept of totality that the Course talks about. It is total. You get the whole deal. When you accept your creation, you got it all. The whole universe of creation. There's nothing to learn. There's nothing to get. You got it all. Selective in its perceptual emphases. Now, that allows for all the differences. All the levels that right. it talks about. My perceptual emphasis may be academia. Yours may be sports. Another might be acting. Another is writing. As long as we have all of these things of associations and emphasis in our perception that we think we're different, then we can hold on to the idea that we're special. We're special. Or that we're right and they're wrong. It preserves your unique little self in this little idea of limitation. 
And it's all based on your terms, your preset term of where you wanted to take this dream that you're dreaming. It's unstable in its functioning and inaccurate in its interpretations. So that's why there's no stability in a dream. You're trying to get life out of death. You're trying to get something out of nothing. So how can there be any stability in your ability to perceive that, to believe your way through this emptiness and make it work when it's all based in what? Guilt, scarcity, loss, separation, death. We talk about guilt, sin. That's the thought system. It is the totality of that thought system. You're trying to get life out of death. You can't do it. So therefore, you're trying to hold on that you can. Well, I'll make it work this time, but you can't. Isn't it interesting that we could go through this so-called life and how maybe someone that really sees this and understands it to walk up and say, you know what? You've been inaccurate in every interpretation. You didn't get one of them right. Because, see, you can't be accurate over an illusion. A dream has no cause, and a dream has no effect. It has no power, except the power you give it to make illusions of it. And the mind is very powerful, and it projects within the mind, not outside of the mind. There's nothing outside of the mind. It projects within the mind this movie called Time, Space, Life, Birth, Death, and all the events that we believe are real, that make up this thing we call life. Now this course is an illusion. It appears in a dream. And so even it has all kinds of interpretations. Only the voice, the voice that gave this course, which is in your mind, in which we believe you're listening to right now because that's the only way that miracles can happen and we can extend a miracle to you. The voice is the only one that can clarify and give you his interpretation of what you're reading, of what you're seeing, of your forgiveness lessons, of your miracle doings. From knowledge and perception, respectively, two distinct thought systems arise which are opposite in every respect. In the realm of knowledge, no thoughts exist apart from God because God and his creation share one will. The world of perception, however, is made by the belief in opposites and separate wills in perpetual conflict with each other and with God. So, what did we make? We're holding on to a thought of separation, which is the opposite of the oneness of heaven, the oneness of spirit, the oneness of knowledge. That is a belief. In order to hold on to separateness, we have to have specialness, which means we have to have differences, which means we have to have all kinds of opposites. And then we have to have separate wills, separate minds trapped in separate bodies. All of that is an illusion. All the thinking of this separate mind is an illusion. It's not thinking at all. Only the thoughts of God are true thoughts. So anything that you're doing to wrestle with the false thoughts, other than bringing them to light, if you're trying to convince, you're trying to argue, you're trying to make a statement, you're in the wrong thought system, and you cannot escape from the thought system you're in. It is total. What perception sees and hears appears to be real. I know in the last session someone was asking, what do we know is real? How do we make things real? Here's Jesus is telling us how we do it. He talked about belief, first of all. But then it says what perception sees and hears appears to be real because it permits into awareness only what conforms to the wishes of the perceiver. There's a big program years ago, What Would Jesus Do? Well, this whole world is based on what would you do? Your individualistic ego idea. That's the only question. What am I going to do? Because it's my world. And my world is going to give me exactly what I wanted it to give me. Now, that does not mean that I am going to have all the money and perfect health and all these things that we call the American dream because that's not what you want. What you want is to block the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of heaven, and you want to see and believe in and accept scarcity, loss, separation, and death. So what are you going to get? What are you asking for? You're asking for those things. That's what you're going to get. Now, if you knew that right off the bat, you'd say, well, I'm done with this scheme. How do I get out of this? But you don't, because this is all hidden. This guilt is hidden in bodies. 
It's hidden in the special relationship. The special love relationship is the ego's chief weapon to keep you from heaven. And so we have all these false promises that are camouflaged as giving you hope in the hopeless. See, the Course says, don't look outside yourself. What you just described is everything that's outside of yourself. Because all the answer is in the true self. So you look into the true self. Now, how do we do that? We've been given a voice. The Father's voice has been given that says, I am to show you. My function is to show you, you. And in showing you, you, you show to the sonship, the sonship. Are you going to be a lighthouse that overlooks the troubled waters and the sinking ships? Are you going to become a lighthouse of immortality that sees the truth behind all of the stormy seas and brings healing to the mind that created or made all the stormy seas and all these little ships that are tossed and turned. Become the light of immortality. That's what even the body can reflect that by being redefined by the Holy Spirit, the only one that can interpret correctly what needs to be interpreted. In our idea of a world, in our idea of a dream, heaven can be reflected and must be reflected because that is all that is real. This leads to a world of illusions, a world which needs constant defense precisely because it is not real. And so there's how we made a world. We made stuff real through the power of mind by utilizing perception and the idea of a false will, false mind, false thinking false projection instead of extending the reality and we make an entire world and it needs defense all the time because it's not real there's nothing there can you imagine the energy of mind that it takes to hold on to this illusion i mean it's just unbelievable when you have been caught in the world of perception you are caught in a dream you cannot escape without help because everything your senses show merely witnesses to the reality of the dream God has provided the answer, the only way out, the true helper. It is the function of His voice, His Holy Spirit, to mediate between the two worlds. Now, this is a recap. So when he says two worlds, he's not saying the difference between heaven and perception. He's talking about two worlds. And he's already taught us that there is a world called the real world. It is another form of perception. It's true perception. It's perfected perception. Because we chose perception. And that way it can lead back to knowledge because it's easily translated to knowledge. So the answer has a function. The Holy Spirit mediates between the two worlds. And he can do this because while on the one hand he knows the truth, on the other, he also recognizes our illusions but without believing in them. It is the Holy Spirit's goal to help us escape from the dream world by teaching us how to reverse our thinking and unlearn our mistakes. So there's the process. Reverse means you have to turn around and go the other way. So the first thing is, what is your goal? If your goal is death and sin, guilt, then you're heading in a certain direction. Everything is moving that direction. The Holy Spirit asks you to stop and give Him the keys to the car. Put the thing in reverse. He doesn't need to even turn it around. He'll do it so quickly, you won't even know what happened, if you'll allow Him to do it. And so He reverses our thinking, changes our thoughts. And now... We're using learning actually to unlearn our mistakes. And again, all this is just an error of mind. It's not sin. It's not the idea of sin. It is but an error. It is a mistake. Forgiveness is the Holy Spirit's great learning aid in bringing this thought reversal about. However, the Course has its own definition of what forgiveness really is, just as it defines the world in its own way. This is a key thing here. We can't inject our definitions into the Course in Miracles. The Course in Miracles got its own definitions. If we're going to get the message, we must understand what it's saying, what is forgiveness, what is the world, world, the real world and the false world. We can't make another dream. It says, don't come with another dream. You accept my dream. And you know this thing about dream up here, it says in this perception you're caught in a dream. If we change this word dream to something that we really can identify with, it says, in your perception, you're caught in a movie theater. 
And this theater is full of all kinds of movies. Any kind of movie you want to go to, you can go to it. Each movie represents a dream. You may be dreaming your identity and your neighbor's dreaming their identity. It's still a dream. A dream is a dream. A movie is a movie, regardless of whether it's a war movie or a love story. It's still a dream. So you have to have help to get out of the theater. The Course in Miracles is a way out of the theater, not just to another movie. But we got to leave the premises. We have to have a change of mind. That analogy, you ever been in a movie, you're watching it, maybe it's a quiet story, and you're hearing all this booming next door, and you're like, man, well, maybe that's a, maybe I'd like to see that movie next. That sounds pretty good. Or you hear people clapping or laughing. or So all these emotions and stuff are attracting you to it. When I was thinking about that, I always think of, well, you walk out of your movie, and you say, I'm going to go see another movie. Let me go run through the lobby and get some popcorn. And outside the lobby, in the bright light of day, is Jesus and every miracle worker, and they're they're waving at you going, come on out, man. Out of the theater. (laughs) Come on out of the show, man. (laughs) It's just a show. The reality is out here. Love is out here. And you may look for a second, or the brightness may be too bright when coming out of the darkness. And so you close your eyes, you grab your popcorn, and you run to the next movie. The crowd outside in the front, outside in the light, They don't believe in time. So they could care less how many movies you want to see. They hope you'll stop seeing. This is your chance for a holy instant right now. In fact, every time you walk past that lobby, it's another holy instant. And ultimately, you're going to recognize the reality of this real world. A good example of what you just said about the light, the darkness, is it says you don't know the difference between pain and pleasure. Both of them is darkness. They're both the same thing. They're both the dream. But you've made a distinction of health and sickness and happiness and sadness. and You didn't bring love into this dream. So you've got your form of love, see. And talking about the bright light, I saw a movie the other night and this guy was with this other guy. He had his rifle and he was going to have to make a shot. And there were bright lights out in front of him, but it was a night shot. And he had his eye closed and the guy says, What's wrong? You got something wrong with your eye? He says, no, I'm preserving my night vision so that when these lights go out, my eye's already ready. So see, the bright lights of outside the theater are painful to those who love darkness or to those who love guilt or to those who love judgment. You must be ready to release what you think is your happiness to find your true self your true function, which is true happiness. We put a screen over the door. Again, we're trying to stay in this, not recognize it. So we put a screen over those windows and doors out front of the theater, and it's called fear. And we look over there, and, oh, that looks pretty good. Well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Fear overcomes us. The course, Jesus told us about if someone comes out of a long imprisonment or something they don't just rush out and say oh hallelujah you got me you can't drag them out of that prison camp they're not ready to come out and so love is gentle love again we're not worried about the time clock we don't believe in time you must understand the power of fear that is in the mind that has elected to hide their own reality the world we see merely reflects our own internal frame of reference the dominant ideas wishes and emotions in our minds. Projection makes perception. And it references the text, page 445. Projection makes perception. A frame of reference, a point of view. Where are you coming from on this, people say. Well, I know exactly where you're coming from. You're coming from whatever your dominant ideas, wishes, and emotions are. We're in the midst of a presidential election. You look at these two people, educated, maybe came from the same area of the nation. They can't see anything in common. And they're looking at the same issues, the same things. And you wonder, how can these opposites be so far apart? And no one will give an inch on either side. Why? Because it's based on this. Beneath all that, no matter what it is, is a dominant idea, a wish, and the emotion that is being projected. You're projecting the movie. You don't change the movie. You've got to deal with the projector. This frame of reference is interesting, too, because you think of a frame and a reference dealing with how can I identify with this idea? 
Well, see, if I'm going to identify with you, and I'm separate from you, and I am my own world, and you are your own world, I'm going to have to invest some of my world into this, so that means I've got to give some of my identity to your frame of reference. Uh-huh. i got to sacrifice something here. got to give up something. Is it worth it? Because the big picture is, by giving a little, can I ultimately take the whole? Can I get more to establish my kingdom and my world? So it's always an investment that has strings attached to every investment. And we do this so quickly in our mind with this frame of reference. We don't think about, hey, I'm going to be investing myself. and I'll, We don't think about it because we've set a system up that works without us having to. So we don't recognize it. We think it's something controlling us outside of us, but you're but doing this to yourself. On a historical or geopolitical level, Hitler, our favorite guy, favorite ego hero, he signs a non-aggression pact with Russia, appearing to give something up, to appease, to join with a, another thought system. All the while, knowing that is a ploy that within one year, we're going to attack, fully attack this entire nation. Always the selfishness of ego. It's This is my world, and, and I, it's my whole world. Anything I appear to give is but an investment. It's give to get, not giving to understand true giving, which is in the realm of knowledge, but an investment. We look inside first, decide the kind of world we want to see, and then project that world outside, making it the truth as we see it. We make it true by our interpretations of what it is we are seeing. If we are using perception to justify our own mistakes, our anger, our impulses to attack, our lack of love in whatever form it may take, we will see a world of evil, destruction, malice, envy, and despair. And so when the world seems to be going to hell, (laughs) all that's happening is individual minds that believe they're individual minds are looking to justify their own mistakes, which is wonderful. Your anger, your impulses to attack, we got to kill this and we got to destroy this. Great. Because at least the camouflage is coming off. You're beginning to have to deal with the fear. You're having to deal with your own monsters that are of your own making because it is your wish. Why? Using perception to justify your own mistakes. All this we must learn to forgive, not because we are being, quote, good and, quote, charitable, but because what we are seeing is not true. We have distorted the world by our twisted defenses and are therefore seeing what is not there. I don't know how many times I've seen tragedy, what we term tragedy, 9-11, whatever, and the people have the video on, and when the picture changes to this colossal tragedy, almost every time you'll hear them say something like, this can't be real. Am I dreaming this? Right in the middle of what's going on, you'll hear those kind of issues because the mind is saying, I don't know that I bought into this, but it did buy into it. So its first thing is the reality to decide, hey, wait a minute, this can't be real. I can't allow this to be real. But it is real because you're making it real. We have distorted the world by our twisted defenses and are therefore seeing what is not there. As we learn to recognize our perceptual errors, we also learn to look past them or, quote, forgive. Now, this is interesting because he says we have distorted the world. Well, what world is being distorted? The real world is being distorted. We've already seen the real world in the correction. Right. So we're having to hold on and distort that world by our twisted defenses, our playing games in the mind. It also says you have time and eternity in you. You have heaven and hell in you. See, the Course in Miracles brings us a picture of heaven and eternity that we forgot by choosing to forget. This is what this is about. This is the contrast that we talk about, how we learn through contrast. Death and life. It says you made death, you deal with death. you got to fix it by seeing that it don't exist except for the purpose you made it for, which is this right here. At the same time, we are forgiving ourselves, looking past our distorted self-concepts to the self, the true self, capital S, that God created in us and as us. 
All right, so this is the process of forgiveness. We look at situations, we look at people that appear to be outside of us, and we begin to forgive them. We begin to see them innocent, and at the same time, we are seeing ourselves innocent because we are the same. It's your world that you're projecting. Well, see, the difference is, let's go back to the theater analogy we were using. You go from the darkness of the theater and going from one viewing room to the next, calling it life, to waking up and embracing the real world, which you become a part of that that stands in the light and in the light of understanding, extending love to those who are calling out and saying, how do I get out of here? It's the call for love. It's the call for help. That's why they run from theater to theater within this dream, looking for the way out. When you now become the way out, you stand in the light and you extend to them their reality and wake them up too. You're the exit sign and the exit and the exit itself. It's shining over there in the corner if they'll just pay attention to it. Sin is defined as, quote, lack of love. Since love is all there is, sin in the sight of the Holy Spirit is a mistake to be corrected rather than an evil to be punished. Our sense of inadequacy, weakness, and incompletion comes from the strong investment in the scarcity principle that governs the whole world of illusions. Let me go back to a mistake to be corrected rather than an evil to be punished. In the United States, we call it a correction system when we put people in jail. That's a nice title, but it's a punishment system. I'm going to take your, quote, freedom and time away. I'm not going to correct anything. In fact, I'm really going to make it worse based on how I'm attacking you. And it's the same thing here. And it's the scarcity principle that governs the whole world. It's all about lack. It's about I've got to have mine. And mine, whether it's me and whatever I associate and extend myself as being me, us four no more, my family, everyone from my name, our company, whatever you're seeing is different and what you associate with, it's all based on scarcity. And when the stuff hits the fan, you see what happens in this thought of scarcity. People start looting. People start hoarding. People start racking up high prices for stuff that they know you need. Why? It's all based in this thought of lack. Remember, we read that right at the beginning. It's all based in the thought of lack and scarcity, which there is none of that in the heavenly mindset. From that point of view or frame of reference, we seek in others what we feel is wanting in ourselves. We love another in order to get something ourselves. That, in fact, is what passes for love in the dream world. And we're doing a whole series on special love relationships that talks about that in depth. There can be no greater mistake than that, for love is incapable of asking for anything. Why would love ask for anything when it is everything? There's nothing to ask for. Only minds can really join, and whom God has joined, no man can put asunder. It is, however, only at the level of Christ's mind that true union is possible and has, in fact, never been lost. The, quote, little I seeks to enhance itself. All right, let's stop right there. True unity is only found in Christ, in the Christ mind, which is the one mind. Not the right mind, but the one mind. But right-mindedness leads you to the one mind. It leads you to understand that true union is already there. It is found in oneness, in communication, in knowledge, and in communion of spirit, of mind. The little eye seeks to enhance itself. Why? Because it sees itself as disjointed, as not in communication. And so it's trying to enhance itself, to make itself acceptable. How? By external approval external possessions, and external, quote, love. So there it is. Stuff. How much stuff can you possess? Who loves you? Pretty baby. Who's going to help you through the night? Prestige. And external approval. That's what's being sought. If you can't understand what's going on, look to those three things, because that is what's going on. They're either after more stuff, another relationship, or a better relationship, or someone's approval. See, we go from seeing the Christ mind, which is the one, to the individual idea of, s- of separate, of me and, and of my world and my kingdom. That's the contrast. We're learning through the contrast here. The Christ mind, and let's just 
as Rich would say, give me some liberties here. Let's think about the father. And the father had a thought. And the father's thought was this. A son. That's the Christ by. That's the thought of God. That's the whole angelata. That's the whole shebang. That's it. Son. Son said father. When father said son. That's the Christ by. The real world returns us back into this embracing of that one thought that we are and returns us from there back to knowledge. The one Christ mind. No longer trying to hold up this little I, this little me. You're little. The self, the true self, that God created needs nothing. Now, I have never noticed this before, but this is the second time that I've noticed it in this section. It says the capital self-capitalized, that capitalized, God capitalized. Even that is capitalized. I'm not sure why yet, but I'm going to look into that. The self that God created needs nothing. It is forever complete, safe, loved, and loving. It seeks to share rather than to get, to extend rather than project. It has no needs and wants to join with others out of their mutual awareness of abundance. Let's go back to the theater. Instead of when you hit the light saying, See you later, guys. Y'all dream your dream. No. They stand and call to the sleeping son and say, Come on. Love calls out and answers love. See, that's the function. It's not the little eye concept anymore at all because it's your true function, your true reality is to extend this to all. The mutual awareness of abundance. We got it all. The we is the we, the that is the that. And I will appear, although I know I'm outside in the front, in the light, I will appear and if you want to go see another movie, I'll go with you. I'm not going to be affected by your movie. No. I'm not believing in your movie. I'm not buying into your dream anymore. But I'll sit here. I I'll st- appear to sit here right. with you. I stand as, as an interpretation that's different. And we're going to make a trip past that popcorn stand to look outside that window to see the light again when you're ready to see it, when you're done with this movie. And maybe we'll walk out of this movie early, and I'll save you some time. But that's what the ministry of the miracle is all about. That's what love is all about. We at Voice from the Real World love this course. I hope you can pick that up in our teaching. And we thank you for joining with us today. As always, we always unify by increasing and integrate by extending. And always remember, the sum of this curriculum is, you are innocent. We are innocent. You are the Son of God. The Son of God is innocent, always has been, and always will be.